when um, many species of magic mushrooms get bruised or bumped into or cut, um, they tend to blue in color. Um, and it's a noticeable, you know, sort of blue indigo color. Um, separate topic, there are different shades of blue, and sometimes it's green. And why is that? Mm. And you can see how it morphs into other questions. Um, but what is that blue stuff? Um, that was kind of the question at the time. Um, and so that that's actually led to some really f fruitful collaborations, uh, in particular with uh, Dirk Hoffmeister, um, who I think um, would probably be the world's expert in the bluing reaction now. Um, and it turns out that uh, the bluing reaction is actually um, due to oxidation of these psychedelic molecules. Um, and through the oxidation, they can connect themselves or couple together into dimers and oligomers. And it's those dimers and oligomers that um, give it the blue color. And then um, I think kind of the funny punchline to that is, and, you know, this is, you know, all, all the credit goes to Dirk Hoffmeister here, um, you know, maybe these mushrooms aren't making, you know, these uh, uh, tryptamines or, or psilocybin to get people high. Mm. Um, maybe um, they're making them so that when they get damaged, they can quickly put them together into um, one of these dimers um, that then can bind to protein or cause some sort of reaction as a defense mechanism. I see. That's interesting. I, I did want to ask you, like, you know, ecologically, why would an organism make something that happens to be psychoactive in a mammalian context? You know, one hypothesis is they actually, you know, want, evolutionarily speaking, to be psychoactive. But another that you just hinted at is that they're doing something else with it. And you, you talked about defense, which seems to be a theme in the plant world when mm. you think about these molecules, whether it's cannabis or psilocybe mushrooms. So can you, can you unpack that a little bit more about why the mushroom would even want to make these molecules, so to speak? Sure, sure. The, the, the place I always have to remind myself to start here is that the mushrooms don't care about you. <laughs> they could care less about your personal experience or your, your mystical experience or anything like that. They're, they're off there being mushrooms. Um, so to, to think that the mushrooms are making these molecules for me, um, I think is a very, um, well, that's a very you know, popular human view um, that they must be doing it for me. Um, the, the defense mechanism tends to fit a lot better, I think, because, you know, these mushrooms want to stay alive so that they can, you know, pass on their genes and uh, continue to grow um, in their environment. And so looking for like those sorts of uh, defensive mechanisms, I think makes more sense when asking why the mushrooms are doing it. Um, and there, you know, it's kind of hard to find a reason why the mushroom would make psilocybin. I mean, in people, um, sure, there's a, a pretty intense um, uh, uh, experience that the person goes through, but there's really no toxicology problems with that. So that can't be the answer there. And I think the same with, you know, at least other mammals. Um, so, I mean, there, you, you really can't come up with a good reason why the mushroom would make psilocybin or bay assistant or anything like that. Um, but in terms of uh, these dimers, um, one of the hypotheses that we're investigating is that the dimers, um, you know, might be paralytics um, or might um, have some toxicity. Uh, we know that they bind um, to proteins. Uh, the dimers do, the blue dimers. Um, so all of that fits. Um, and it would make quite a bit of sense because when would the mushroom want to sort of launch this defense mechanism? Well, when something's eating it or damaging it, and when does this start happening? Well, well the, the, the mushroom tissue gets damaged, and through the damage, now the uh, molecules can get oxidized. And then as they get oxidized, they become susceptible to the dimerization reaction, which makes these blue dimers and oligomers. And so it's sort of like an on-demand defense system for them. I see. And when you say dimerize and oligomerize, you just mean individual molecules literally starting to link up and creating larger structures. Exactly like that. Dimer is two, oligomer is more than two. <laughs> Interesting. So, so it could literally be some kind of physical defense barrier thing. Yes. Uh, and it makes a lot more sense than the mushrooms caring about my mental health. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so getting into some of the chemistry now, can you unpack for people like what is psilocybin as a chemical structure and how is it actually synthesized within the biochemical pathways of these mushrooms? Let me see if I can do that off the top of my head. So psilocybin is a pretty simple molecule. It's a tryptamine molecule, which means that, um, you know, it's a, it's two rings fused to one another, very similar to, uh, tryptophan. Um, which we have in our bodies, which I believe is the first uh, part of the biosynthesis in that tryptophan gets decarboxylated or loses its carboxylic acid group to make tryptamine. Um, then the tryptamine um, has another oxygen atom added. Um, so making psilocybin would be added in the four position of the 
tryptamine, and then that part of the molecule gets a phosphate group put on it. It gets phosphorylated, and then the um, ethanolamine part of the molecule gets a first methyl group put on it, and that's how we make bayocystin. Um, before we put the methyl group on it, it would be norbayocystin, but one methyl group is bayocystin. Then it gets meth methylated again, and you get psilocybin. Um, there is another molecule after that called arugacin, which has a third methyl group on it, um, but it is unclear right now how that third methyl group gets on there. Mm. So I, I'm seeing an analogy here with cannabis where you've got these sort of uh, biochemical pathways where one molecule gets turned into another one. And so depending on the growth characteristics or the um, level of maturation that the plant, or in this case, the mushrooms at when you harvest it and process it, it's going to uh, dictate to some extent the ratio of some of these different compounds, how how far on the pathway you've gone. And so they're, they're all sort of like one or two steps from each other, right? They are all definitely still one or two steps from one another, and it makes perfect sense when you look at a scheme, you know, that, you know, compound uh, one goes to two to three to four to five, and they actually kind of, the, the phosphorylated ones, bayocystin and norbayocystin, psilocybin and psilocin, arugacin, and 4-hydroxy uh, trimethyl tryptomonium, um, those actually convert back and forth into one another. Um, but as simple as that scheme is, um, this idea of, oh, well, we can just pick them earlier and get a different ratio, um, that still needs to get worked out. Mm. Um, and it's quite possible that different species of magic mushrooms have different forms or amounts of enzymes um, that you know cause each one of these little steps to go a little bit faster, a little bit slower, or if they're in equilibrium, tends to shift the equilibrium a little bit one way or another. And so I think those things, um, I mean, if one of those things complicates the, the situation, like imagine six or seven of them all complicating it at the same time. And so how to get you know, one molecule out of it is a, a hard question. Right. And so what are, so you mentioned some of these other compounds. Can you, what, what is known about things like baocystin and some of these other molecules? Do we know, I mean, beyond the, the raw chemistry, do we know if they have psychoactive effects or interact with interesting receptors that might be um, of interest therapeutically? Uh, first answer is we know very, very little. Um, and, and frankly, like no one was looking at these um, uh, in 2016, 2017, which is why this became a great garage project for me. <laughs> um, since then, there's been a, a ton of great work done, and we're you know gaining ground quickly. Um, but if you think about sort of the you know obvious uh, set of molecules that you would expect to be in the magic mushrooms, you would have you know zero, one, two, or three methyl groups up on the ethanolamine arm, and then it could be phosphorylated or not phosphorylated. So now you have a set of eight. Um, and those eight would be um, norbayocystin and 4-hydroxytryptamine that has no methyls on there. Um, and then you would have bayocystin and norcilocin, and then you would have psilocybin and psilocin, and then you would have arugacin and 4-hydroxytrimethyltryptamonium to fill out the set of eight. Um, at the time, people knew about psilocybin and psilocin and had studied its cellular pharmacology and, you know, 2016, 2017, um, you know, folks at Johns Hopkins had done a lot of nice work and Compass Pathways was moving it towards clinical trials. The other molecules, uh, almost nothing, um, you know, um, but since then, um, uh, some folks have synthesized uh, bayocystin and arugacin. Um, uh, Alex Sherwood um, at the USONA Institute um, had a nice paper, I think it was 2017, maybe 2018, um, with those syntheses. And, um, you know, bayocystin has at least um, shown some really interesting results. Um, so bayocystin is a prodrug of norcilocin. Um, so just like psilocybin isn't the active molecule in magic mushrooms, it hydrolyzes into psilocin. Mm -hmm. um, bayocystin does the same thing with norcilocin. So the the active component is this hydrolyzed molecule that's liberated by um, the prodrug when you consume it. Um, and so if you look at the cellular pharmacology of norcilocin, um, it's arguably more potent in functional assays at the serotonin 2A receptor than psilocin is. I see. Um, so meaning you're, when you say functional assay, you mean doing experiments to measure its receptor interaction directly? 
Yes. So um, in in vitro, uh, you can do a binding affinity study. You know, how well does this ligand compete with a radio ligand? How well does it bind to the receptor? Or a functional assay is, um, you know, looking at fluorescence to see how well that ligand makes the neuron fire. Mm, Yeah. Um, And they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, um, But in any case, uh, norcelosin binds really well to the serotonin to a receptor. And um, in both um, binding affinity uh, uh, studies and all also um, you know, is functionally very potent at the serotonin 2A receptor. Um, so, you know, just taking that data there, you would expect, hey, we have another super potent psilocin-like psychedelic in the mushrooms. Um, but the rub there is that when you do another test, um, the head twitch um, uh, experiments, um, which is the gold standard for is this a trippy molecule, um, the mice don't shake their heads. I see. Uh, and so the head twitch is basically you give uh, you give a known... You give a molecule with known psychedelic effects in a human to a mouse. And because the mouse can't tell you if it's tripping and it's kind of hard to discern, what people have discovered is that they kind of have this head twitch response where they very quickly twitch their head. And that's our proxy for whether or not something might be hallucinogenic in a human being. Yes, that is the state of the art. You you give it to a mouse, and if the mouse twitches its head, there is a very strong correlation between a mouse twitching its head and a person having a psychedelic experience. Is um And how... How strong is that correlation? Are there any instances where we know something is hallucinogenic, but it doesn't do the head twitch, or they do the head twitch, but we know that it's not hallucinogenic in humans? Uh, I think there are a couple of counterexamples, but I mean, that still makes it just an unbelievably great assay. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, and I'm going to get this wrong, I think it might be lysergamide. So like it's one of the relatives of LSD, um, is a potent serotonin 2A agonist. um, But when you give it to a mouse, uh, no head twitch response. And then I'm not sure if there's an anecdotal evidence about people eating it. And so this molecule that you've described, norcilosin, is this, so it's apparently potentially more potent than psilocybin. It's activating serotonin 2A receptors, the so-called psychedelic receptor. Is this is this molecule tending to be in very minute quantities in the mushrooms, or are there some species that actually have uh, a good amount of it? Um both. Um, uh, for one, in, in, in some mushrooms, it's, you know, barely there. So, I mean, it's definitely a minor uh, tryptamine. Um, I think in uh, other samples and other sets of mushrooms, it can be uh, up to a third um, of the tryptamines that are present, which is a very appreciable amount. And um, if you look at, you know, some data for psilocybe azarescens mushrooms, you know, where it's present uh, as about a third, a quarter, a third of the uh, tryptamines there, um, the absolute amount is considerable. Uh, Because remember, that's a mushroom that has a lot of these tryptamines. And so, you know, uh, a third of a lot is more than you would get in a less potent mushroom. Yeah. So azarescens, that's the one that's anecdotally reported to be one of the trippiest species out there. And so there seems to be something that is potentially lining up here. Uh, yeah, that would be another, um, uh, another piece of very anecdotal evidence that I would put into the, um, I guess entourage effect bucket. Um, uh, the other thing about, um, Bay assistant norcelosin and the not trippiness is that there is actually a report of somebody taking pure Bay assistant mm. and it's not just somebody, um, it's, uh, Paul Stamets who normally I would dismiss, you know, an N equals one self-administered study where someone's eating drugs. Um, but this is Paul Stamets. He, he knows magic <laughs> mushrooms and he knows about, um, you know, what liftoff means. And he was on the, the Joe Rogan podcast uh, talking about how he was, you know, very anxious for, you know, some reason. Um, and uh, I think one of his trips had, you know, had fallen apart at the last minute, but he decided to do this Bay Assistant test anyway. And under the guidance of a physician um, took pure Bay Assistant and was waiting for the psychic experience that Paul Stamets probably knows better than anyone. Um, and it didn't happen. Um, hmm. but he felt an overall sense of complete calm and peace with the world. Interesting. Um, and, uh, so, you know, that's where that makes sense in terms of the serotonin 2A activity. Um, and, um, it also, you know, it, N equals one, but corroborates this, you know, corroborates what the mouse is doing. I mean, the mouse isn't shaking its head. Paul Stamets isn't tripping. There's this ser- par- powerful serotonergic effect, and Paul's feeling calm. Um, so, so remind me. So, Bay Assistant is doing what at at the different receptors? Bay Assistant's doing nothing um, because Bay Assistant is a pro drug. Okay. Um, oh, I see. Okay, so, so that's the norcilosin. It turns into norcilosin. Oh yeah, exactly. Okay, so no, uh, no psychedelic effect in this uh, 
N equals one pulse damage experiment, yep. even though it's activating 5-HT2A. Yes, which we know from cellular assays. Interesting. Interesting. And so is, is, it, uh, is it a mystery at that point? We don't really know what's going on there? Oh, well, I mean, we, we know more that's going on than ever now. Now it's, you know, okay, can we connect the dots even further? Um, you know, so, okay, so we know no HTR in mice. We know that it has certain serotonin 2A activity. Um, what else could be going on here? Um, wouldn't it be great to get that molecule into people? Um, because if it really is um, a, um, sh- a, a fast-acting um, anxiolytic molecule um, that doesn't have, you know, really any, um, you know, toxicity issues or downside, uh, that could be a good drug.